Solace and Sanctuary by Ignium807. Chapter 7. Lambert and Eskel give more warning than Geralt did. Yasker has time to dress and eat before he greets them at the door. Winter winds cut through his silks and he curses into the empty morning, his displeased smile turning genuine at the sounds of hoofbeats down the road. The two witches ride right up to the door and drop down from their horses. Yasker is immediately caught up in a vicious hug, all old riding leathers and hunt-hearted muscles. Mellet tell his tits, he says, grinning. You two reek. Lambert answers him with a rumble. Better than whatever smell you've got on, what is that, flowers? Honeysuckle, Jasker defends. It's in season. As the men catch up, a stable girl emerges from the shadows to take their horses and offers Eskel a nod of recognition. He nods back. Yasko sees the exchange and lets out a dramatic groan. Not you too, Eskel. Has every bloody person on the continent meant to let home in the last few months? Everyone except you, Eskel says. He throws an arm around Yasko's waist and leads them inside. How's Leo these days? Letha waits for the wolves in the sitting room. Geralt is across from him, not tense but not relaxed, waiting for his brothers and his bard. They sweep through the door with a wave of laughter and warm words. Lambert with his sharp glares, Eskel in the full glory of his pragmatism, and Julian stood between them with his voice already raised, telling stories of the weeks they've been apart. He isn't sure what Geralt told the others about Letho's presence, but whatever it was, it seems to have worked. Eskel gives him a long, hard look and a sharp nod before focusing on Geralt. Lambert dares to step closer. He stands a few feet from Letho with one hand on a dagger and tilts his head a challenge. You make a move, and I got you, he says. Oi! Julian pulls himself away from conversation with Eskel and lays a hand on Lambert's shoulder. Letho expects a shrug and a harsh word from Lambert, famous for his anger. Instead, his posture softens and his hand falls from his dagger. He turns to Julian, looking almost sheepish. Just looking out for you. I know, Julian answers, but this is going to be a violence-free winter. He shifts so his voice will carry to the entire room. You two idiots hear that through? Violence-free winter! Eskel jeers and Geralt flips him off, but all three men are smiling. But the wonders if it's even possible. Four witches under one roof for a few months? There's bound to be some violence. Fine, Lambert grits out. But if he hurts someone, I'm cutting his throat out. Julian thumps him on the back and laughs. We won't have any problems then. He had his chance to kill me and he didn't take it. Fucking what? Lambert growls, hand flying back to his dagger. Letho decides it's time to speak up for himself. Your bard is a crazy one, not me. I'm just here for Leo's chicken stew. Across the room, he can see Eskel perk up. Leo meant chicken stew? A polite cough comes from the threshold. Leo stands there, hands neatly folded in front of him, smiling softly. I did, I did. He sketches a bow to Eskel and Lambert. Welcome home, boys. You look old. There's air in the kitchen and food. Help yourselves. They go. Geralt stays behind with Julian, caught up in a conversation too low for Letho to hear. He wanders off to leave them with each other. The afternoon passes like a slow-moving stream. Letho does his best to reside where the others do not, only emerging from the recesses of the manor when Leo calls them for dinner. Choosing a place to sit causes a frustrating spike of anxiety for Letho. In any other circumstances, he would simply refuse to break bread with the wolves. But he knows that taking his plate elsewhere will offend Julian, and he can't stand the look of reproach that Leo would undoubtedly send his way. The dining room table is large enough to seat twenty. Lambert, Eskel, and Geralt are all cramped together on one side, their knees bumping underneath a table clearly built to accommodate smaller men. Julian is in the kitchen with Leo, speaking animatedly about some noblewoman or another. Letho sits directly across from the other three. It's not a challenge, per se. It's more a way of declaring that he was there first, he was welcomed by Julian, and he will not be cowed. Lambert's expression still screams murder, but Geralt gives him a slight nod, and Letho knows the other two won't cross the white wolf, not with Julian around. The bard himself joins them a few minutes later. He sweeps into the room with three plates balanced precariously on each arm and goes about setting them down in front of people. Geralt is first with a wink from Julian, then the others. One plate is dropped at the head of the table, 
At first, Letho assumes it's for Julian. He is the Viscount, after all. But he moves away from the head of the table and collapses in the seat next to Letho, wiping his forehead melodramatically as he sets down his own plates. I'm not cut out to be a serving boy, he jokes. The temptation to drop a bowl of stew on some smelly patron would be too great. And serving boys don't wear silk, Eskel says. Oh, but really, Julian says. They are oh so comfortable. Julian knocks his elbow into Letho's like they're sharing an inside joke. Letho takes it as an invitation to speak and asks, Why aren't you at the head of the table? Too formal. Julian waves a hand at the gathered group and then at himself, trying to indicate the ties between them. I'm a Viscount count by technicality, not lifestyle. It would feel wrong not to sit with all of you. Who is at the head, then? Leo, Julian says. Lambert snorts and Eskel eyes a smile behind his sip of veil. Isn't he your housekeeper? Geralt asks. Sort of, but he's also my... Julian trails off. He drums his fingers on the table, and Lethal can practically see the gears turning in his head as he searches for a suitable metaphor. A huff of frustration escapes him, and he wraps his knuckles against the wood. It's like this, Geralt. He's a father to me the way Vesemir was to you. Less of a taskmaster than Vesemir, but you get the point. Just traditionally, my real father would sit at the head of the table because his status would be highest. Now it should be me because I'm the Viscount, but I've already explained why I don't do that, and it would feel equally awkward for Leo to sit next to me. So I put him at the head, and we both agreed to ignore propriety for the night. Julian ends his rant with an exasperated gesture towards the front of the table, as if to say, See? Just to test the waters, Letho sets a heavy hand on his shoulder. Solemnly, he says, That's way too many rules. A startled laugh pushes its way past Eskel's lips. He turns it into a cough and looks deeply into his mug, a furrow between his brows, as if he can't believe the sound he just made. But Letho heard it. The rest of dinner is wrapped in tension that gradually eases as the night goes on. Like the rigging of a ship going slack as the wind falls out of the sails, Letho lets himself get swept away by the cadence of Julian's voice and the sacred experience of a good meal. The others relax as well, dropping their guards as Julian's stories grow less believable and Leo's jokes settle lightly in the air. A hint of a smile teases the corners of Geralt's face, though he's too on edge to let it go further than that. A good deal of Letho's comfort comes from the constant stream of friendly touches from the bard at his side. Julian gesticulates wildly when he talks. His hands often come to rest on Letho's shoulders or tap on his back. At one point, Julian steals a piece of bread off his plate and Letho can't bring himself to be upset. He keeps waiting for one of the wolves to be bothered by it. Surely if Julian were flirting, Geralt would speak up. And even if he isn't flirting, because Letho doesn't think he is, it seems like Lambert or Eskel would be perturbed by the sheer familiarity with which he treats Letho. Uh, but none of them say a word. Their eyes don't even linger on where Julian has touched them, though Letho himself can feel every spot like a white hot poker burning through his shirt. After an entire evening of agonizing over it, Letho decides that maybe Julian is just like that. Affectionate. And it's a good thing he is, because Letho never wants him to stop. He wants to sit at that dinner table and soak up Julian's casual touches for the rest of his life. He can't, of course. The meal comes to an end, and Leo clears the plates away as they all stand up. Without the others there, this is the time of night that Letho would make his way outside and go for a run. He isn't sure where he's meant to be with the wolves around. Julian leads the group into a room with a roaring fire and several large couches. Their stain increased, unlike the perfectly decorated furniture in the front rooms of the house. Lambert and Eskel drop onto one with matching size. Geralt goes to stoke the fire, and Julian... He lies down and drops his head into Lambert's lap, like it's the most natural thing in the world. Lambert drops his hand to Julian's head and tugs on a strand of air. Lazy, he says. We came all this way for the music, and you won't even play us something. Julian groans. Make Eskel play. None of us want that, Eskel says. I'm several months out of practice. Lethal needs a moment to process the new information. Eskel plays an instrument? Eskel? By the time he manages to tune back into the conversation, Julian is grinning his assent. Fine, he says, if you insist, but I'm not getting up. Lazy, 
Geralt says. Still, he dusts his hands off and walks out of the room. A minute later, he returns with Julian's lute held gently in one hand. Julian takes it without moving his head from Lambert's lap and sets about tuning it. When he seems satisfied with the sound, he hums and cranes his neck up at Lambert. Any requests? Riverside romp, Lambert says. Julian lets a startled peal of laughter. Who's been teaching you dirty songs? Heard it in a tavern in Skellig a few weeks back. Sounded like the kind of thing you would know how to play. Of course I know how to play it. Julian's face manages to convey indignation and pride all at once. I am the best bard on the continent. I don't know, Geralt says. Have you ever heard of a man named Baldo Marx? Julian gasps! Geralt! For shame! You're sleeping on the couch tonight. As the gags Julian gently, a laugh half formed on his lips. Play! Julian sips up just enough to shoot Geralt a glare as his fingers move on the strings. It's a fast song. He plays single notes at first, but soon enough starts to pluck the strings with one hand while the other forms ever-changing chords. The effect is music that sounds like far more than one instrument is playing it. Like any good tavern song, the lyrics are filthy. Julian's voice runs over the words with just the right lilt. Just the right exits. Ewings and Geralt halfway through a particularly graphic verse. Litho marvels at how natural it all is. He can't imagine it's easy to play a lute and sing lying down, but Julian seems to have the skill mastered. It speaks to hours of practice. The way Lambert taps his foot and Eskel drums his fingers against Julian's leg tells Letho that they have done this before. They've had a hundred nights lying around the fire listening to Julian sing, feeling safe enough to leave their weapons in another room and waste the hours away. Dawn to dusk is next, followed by fires in Redania and along the banks. Letho was never one to seek out music, but he has to admit that Julian is good. Really good. His voice fills the corners of the room with light, turning the air warm and thick as honey. Along the banks fades into silence, and Julian lifts an eyebrow. Requests? Lambert catches Letho's eye. There is steel in his gaze. The sword that split the continent, he says. The piece Letho was basking in flies into the fire and dies screaming. He knows that song. It was written about him, about his crimes. The artist was a young woman whose family he had killed many years ago. The song wove stories of murder and fire, of his sword and the chaos that followed in his bloody path. It was to blame for the darkest parts of his reputation. And every word of it was true. No, Julian says. His eyes are sad as he sits up and places his loot on a nearby table. No part of his body touches Lambert anymore. I think it's time we all turned in. Ju ask her. Lambert starts, but Julian cuts him off. Second floor, third room on the left. I'll be there in a minute. I need to change. He picks up his loot and nods to Letho. Good night. Then he's gone. Eskel turns the hard eyes on his brother. Really? Lambert starts. Are we all going to pretend we weren't him here? He tried to kill Geralt not too long ago, or don't you fucking remember that? I don't respect the no violence rule if I have to, but there's no fucking point in lying to each other. I want him gone. Oh, don't, Geralt says. Lambert turns on him, face twisted with betrayal. You can't mean that. I do. I want him here, and so does Yesker. Lambert is on his feet, feeling for a weapon he is a carrying. He settles for a vicious gesture in Geralt's direction. You've lost your fucking mind. He's a gangslayer. He's a murderer. We all are, Eskel mutters. Geralt drops a heavy hand on his brother's shoulder. You may not like it. But this is not your decision to make. He stays. Lambert turns to Letho. I'd throw you out in pieces if I could. I know, Letho says with a sneer. But you can't. Lambert storms out and leaves the three of them alone. I don't like your brother very much, Letho says. Eskel gets up from his position on the couch and stretches. The feeling is mutual, he deadpans. Come on, Geralt, you know Yasker won't have grabbed enough blankets. We should raid the upstairs closets before we join him. Geralt nods. He and Eskel go upstairs together, their boots echoing thickly on the staircase as they ascend. Letho hears them opening doors and bickering for a while. Then Julian's voice says, 
Falcon finally is cold in here. And one heavy door slammed silence into the house. In this silence, Letho's thought turns inward. It amazes him how Geralt came to his defense, though he knows it was more for Julian's sake than his own. Lambert's reaction was what he expected from all of them. The unexpected neutrality from Eskel and the grudging of acceptance from Geralt are more than he could have asked for. Besides, what does Lambert matter in the face of Julian's warmth? He is so caught up in analyzing the events of the day that the fire burns down to embers. When it does, Letho was pulled from his thoughts by the gold. Only then does he piece together what happened when Julian left. Sack of floor, third room on the left. You know Yasker won't have grabbed enough blankets. Fucking finally. They're sleeping in the same room. You can't remember the last time you slept in the same room as another person. Certainly not recently, and definitely not unarmed. They must be unarmed, because Julian would never allow weapons in the bedroom. Vito can't imagine it. Do they share a bed? Eskel's comment about the blankets would suggest that. Do they hold each other? Could Julian's natural affection possibly extend that far? Lizzo slams down those thoughts before they could consume him. There is no use dwelling on what the wolves are doing. There is no use remembering the burn of Julian's hand on his skin at dinner. He is a man of action and efficiency. These thoughts have no place in his mind. He stands. He goes upstairs. He lights his fire, sharpens his sword, and lies down on his back in bed, eyes turned to the ceiling. He sleeps. Alone. Alone.